I'm Heidi Marston. I'm the Executive Director for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. So the point in time numbers this year um, paint a picture that says homelessness is up uh, over last year. The number of people who fall into homelessness continue to outpace the number of people we're able to lift out of homelessness every year. However, there are bright spots in those numbers that include we are making progress year over year. Uh, we are serving more people in our system. Year over year, more people are being placed into housing. Um, we saw an increase in people who were sheltered this year, so that really demonstrates the work it's been done to build new shelters and get people inside. All of that is, is great news um, and we just have to do more faster to keep pace. I think the frustrating part for these numbers is recognizing how hard we see everybody working every day and the commitment of not only LASA but the, the city, the county, all of our nonprofit providers doing incredible things um, and still seeing the numbers fall in. The inflow is driven by a number of very big systemic issues to include housing affordability, the economy, jobs, uh, living wages, uh, and especially we saw a big focus this year in racism and how racism plays a huge part in how people fall into homelessness and fall through the safety net systems that exist, recognizing that black people are four times more likely in Los Angeles County to experience homelessness than their white counterparts. We see time and time again that racism is woven into the fabric of every big system that exists across the entire country. And until we get to a point where all of our systems are not only identifying it, naming it, and eradicating it through looking at data, making policy changes, building in protections and safety nets, we're gonna have a really hard time closing the gap in that disparity. Um, you can see it in communities. You can see it when you look back at the redlining practices and, and how those communities today are being impacted and, and how they're disadvantaged. So all of that, that lens needs to be brought to every policy de decision that's made from the federal government all the way down to the, the local city government, uh, including LASA. What's interesting about the count this year is while it does in fact reflect where we were on one night in January, uh, the world has completely changed since, since January. We've seen COVID-19 come, uh, we've seen civil unrest, There's there's been so much happening. Uh, and so while it is important to recognize where we were, we have to look at the success that has been built and the momentum that's been built through a global pandemic. Uh, we have seen more people move into shelter faster than ever, 6,000 people within a three month period uh, we've, we've never been able to activate and move that quickly. So while it, it's unfortunate it took a global pandemic, it did show us that we can move quickly, we have capacity, we just need the resourcing and the will, um, the political will, the public will to get it done. Project Room Key, we have about 34 hotels and 3,600 people in those rooms. Uh, we've total, we have about 6,000 people that we've helped through the city rec and park sites, the trailers we received from the state, and Project Room Key. Uh, it's it's going amazing. These folks who are going in are incredibly grateful. It's so amazing to talk to folks and and remind them that they are worthy of having these. These are really nice hotels in some cases, and and they deserve that. It's dignity when Project Room Key goes away, we're, we're moving them into housing, we're moving them into another shelter, potentially something that keeps them there and moves them on the path to end their homelessness. Prevention is a huge piece of it. Some of it lives with LASA. Some of the prevention work, however, needs to be pushed upstream to other systems. Um, homelessness and the homeless system is a safety net system, but we should be the last safety net of all of the safety nets. So by the time you come to our front door, every other system has failed you. Um, and why is that happening? And why are they coming to this front door instead of others? We need to focus on those other front doors and make sure that they, they don't get to our front door in the first place. When we talk about prevention at LASA, we're talking about folks who are really on their last leg, that they're three days away from being evicted. They just fell into homelessness today. Um, and we have, we have very flexible funding we provide, whether it's a, a rental subsidy, whether it's helping them catch up on their rental arrears so they stay housed. 
one of the largest things people said is what could have stopped me from becoming homeless is somebody who cared about me, somebody who understood where I was coming from. Uh, even sometimes simple things like a tool that is the, the component that they need to do their job broke. So fixing that tool or getting them a new tool or an instrument is the thing that makes the difference. So flexible funding in that way has been a tremendous success. Last year we helped 6,000 people and we prevented them from falling into homelessness. Generally, when we see an increase in the population, we see unsheltered numbers go up. So we have people falling in, but our capacity to shelter them is getting better and better. Uh, so that's fantastic. It means we're the bridge home programs that we're building out, the motel systems, all of those things are coming through. What we need now is something on the back end to move people out. So when we have a shelter bed, as opposed to serving one person per year, we can serve five people per year because we're moving people into a permanent solution. We needed affordable housing before the pandemic hit. We needed, um, whether it was new stock or existing stock, we needed new housing, um, and now we need it even more. In addition to that, we need to really make sure that we are preventing people from falling in um, and keeping them housed and doing whatever it takes to keep folks housed. So there, we have to figure out the best ways to close those gaps. We continue to see wages um, not keeping pace with rental costs across the whole county. Uh, and we see that more acutely now, even in the lens of COVID-19, recognizing that over 600,000 people have lost their jobs just since the beginning of the pandemic. So it makes it that much more urgent. $41 an hour just to afford a one bedroom apartment is unacceptable. And that's why we see in a lot of our programs, I think about some of our safe parking programs uh, where I've gone and spoken to some of the folks and, and their teachers. Um, they're they're healthcare workers. They're they're working full time. These the, it's not people who don't work and don't have jobs. They just can't afford to live. Um, and I think that is the true injustice: is that we have people and we're expecting them to work not only more than 40 hours a week, but 40, 60, 80 hours a week just to be able to ha have a, an apartment. Part of what we see is, is what we believe. So when you think of homelessness, you often think of the people that you see that appear to be homeless. And frankly, those are people sometimes who might be very mentally ill and having psychotic symptoms or people who are high on drugs who are on the street. Um, but what's really important to remember is the, the people that you don't see. There's 66,000 people experiencing homelessness. A lot of them are in their cars, a lot of them are on couches, a lot of them are in shelter. Um, particularly this year we saw an increase in our families who are experiencing homelessness. So we have to make sure that our observational bias isn't guiding how we think about everybody. And we have to make sure that we're not stigmatizing the population based on that alone. Of the people we placed in 2018, 88% stayed housed. Um, that's that's a myth that it, this is helping to bust. So a lot of times folks, folks think we house people and they just fall back in and they cycle and cycle. Sometimes that happens. Um, most of the time it doesn't happen. Uh, when we set folks up for success, we connect them with the resources they need. Sometimes it's very intensive case management. Sometimes it's just a subsidy to help them pay their rent so they can make that difference up. Um, they're successful. People want to be indoors. People want to be housed. They want community. We need to build on the momentum that has already started. We need to continue continue the resourcing, continue the work and the pace, and take the folks who have been moved inside, move them into housing so we can create more opportunities for folks to fill behind them. Um, we have a unique moment in time with a high level of resourcing coming from the government. We at LASA have developed a long-term recovery plan. We need that funded so we can do the work and build on all of the progress that we've made. I'm hopeful that we continue to see progress in housing individuals. I'm hopeful in seeing that we have ha even sheltered so many people through COVID COVID-19 and we have a moment where the market has softened and we can actually get folks inside and engage with landlords in a meaningful way. Uh, I think we just we need to continue the progress that we've we've built upon. Um, you can volunteer with our service provider agencies. There's a lot of work being done, whether it's donate your time, volunteering um, money, resources, whatever it is. Um, 
everybody has a role to play in solving this crisis. Um, that's been true since the beginning, but even more so now in the context of what's happening in the world, we see that um, this could have been any of us. So the, the best thing that we can do is have compassion, recognize that with every person you see, there's a life, a story, a circumstance, pain, um, and we need to have some compassion.